All righty, take your Bible tonight if you would. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, okay? 2 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> we pick up tonight the last three verses. We won't get all of them done, but we're going to start on it and jump into it and get it in the context of what uh, Paul is writing to Timothy here. And I think it'll be some things that'll help us. The Bible says in verse 24, 2 Timothy 2, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Father, add your blessing now to the reading of our scripture here this evening, and Lord, as we open up your word tonight, we ask that you would help us open our understanding, Spirit of God, be our teacher, and help us to rightly divide the word of truth tonight. Take the truth into each of our hearts this evening, put out of our mind things that would distract us and uh, keep us from hearing uh, the still small voice of the Spirit of God. Lord, let us glean some things that will help us to be vessels of honor unto you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, we talked last week about being vessels in the house of God. Remember up in verse 19, or verse number 20, there's a great house that are, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood of earth, and some to honor, and some to dishonor. So we have, there's some vessels that are honorable, and some that are dishonorable. Uh, vessels are believers. Vessels are Christians. We're all vessels. And uh, I, I think maybe we ought to look at more like vessels uh, that are good vessels and broken vessels. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that I would call them bad vessels. I'm not sure people are bad as much as they are just broken because when it comes down to it, we're all bad. Uh, that's, that's just who we are in our own nature. The only thing good about us is Jesus Christ. Uh, the fact that he saved us, all right? And so uh, here's what, what he's reminding Timothy, I think, is. Again, he tells him in verse 21, remember, we're to purge himself from these. You'll be a vessel unto honor. That, that you have to be willing to allow God to separate you from those who don't love God, who don't want to serve God. If you, if you spend time around people who don't want to serve God, pretty soon you won't want to serve God either. <clears throat> you become like those you hang around. And so you have to purge yourself. You separate yourself from that. But, listen, the, all the vessels are in the house. All the vessels are in the house of God. They're in the church. Well, how do we help those vessels? How do I, how do I help them if I'm separate from them? Paul's going to tell us how to do that here. He's going to instruct Timothy how to do that. He says, you avoid, in verse 23, remember, Foolish and unlearned question, avoid. Why do you avoid them? Because they just gender strife. They're just going to bring about arguments. Okay, so what am I supposed to do? I'm not going to associate with them. I'm not going to argue with them. What am I supposed to do? Well, we're supposed to rescue them. We're supposed to recover them. All right? And, and we're, to, we're to help recover those that are taken captive by Satan at his will. In fact, you remember when Jesus began His ministry. And He started in the synagogue. And when He got an opportunity to read, He opened to the book of Isaiah chapter 61. And He read these words. It's, I'll, I'll read what He read in Luke chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. He said, when He opened the book, He found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon Me, because He hath anointed Me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent Me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised. Notice especially that, that phrase, deliverance to the captives. Satan loves to make people captive. He loves to put men and women in bondage. What Satan likes to do is to blind people, first of all, to their need of a Savior. He would like to blind them that they even need, need salvation. But if he fails at that and they do get saved and they do trust Christ their Savior, then what he'd like to do, he would like to um, keep them in bondage to sin, keep them in bondage to wrong habits and addictions 
so that they'll never do anything positive for God. That they'll never fulfill God's will for their life. And we see that week after week after week in our RU programs. Most of the people that we come across, whether it's in our Friday night program or in the program in the prisons, many of these men who struggle with addictions and who struggle with stubborn habits are saved individuals. They have a time when they've put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior, but they're still struggling with addiction. They're struggling with stubborn habits. They don't have victory in their life at all. They're in bondage. And, and they would be the vessels of dishonor in the house. Well, how are we going to help them? How are we going to... In the, in the war we're in, and we're in a spiritual warfare, they would, be, they would be those who are taking captive as prisoners of war. And, and some, some by their own mistakes, and some by the deception of the enemy. But in any event, they're still prisoners of war. And we're not to just ignore them and say, well, too bad, the enemy got them. We're just supposed to try to recover them and, and get them back into our army. I don't... I don't I don't want them to take prisoners. The Bible says, notice in the verse here in 2 Timothy, verse number 26, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. The devil likes to, to take people prisoner. And the snares that he, use, that he uses are things like bitterness, unresolved conflicts, Jealousy, anger, greed, lust. Listen, all sin is addictive. All sin is addictive. I know sometimes we can get pretty hard on somebody whose sin is different than mine. And I can think they're pretty wicked and they're pretty evil. You know why? They don't, they're not addicted to the same sin I am. And their sin is always worse than mine is. But all sin is addictive. It seeks to control us. And so, we've got to reach people who are in the snare of Satan and, and help them to be recovered for the cause of Christ. And by the way, whether they're lost and need to be saved, or I believe in this context, it's saved people who need to be recovered. There are, there are many, many people who profess faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior who are not living for Him tonight. They're in bondage. And they're, they're, they're enslaved by habits and addictions and other things that keep them from living for God. Well, how can we reach them? How can we recover the vessels that are dishonorable? They're, they're, they're taken captive in, our, in the warfare as prisoners of war. How can we do that? Well, I think he tells us right here in these verses. Verse 24, he says, and well, let me go to it. I turned my page. He said, the servant of the Lord must not strive. First of all, we realize that we are servants. The servant of the Lord. Now you have to understand, in our society, when we use the word servant, we don't really understand that word. Okay? Okay. Um, Certainly not the way they would have understood it in, in earlier times and certainly in Bible times. God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. In our mind, we think, well, a servant can't do very much. When somebody is a, just a hired servant, we just look at them as a hired servant. Not much help. Not much influence. But you understand... You see, in our society, we exalt the king, but God exalts the servant. We exalt the one who makes a lot of money, but uh, God... Listen, if somebody has a lot of money, they have the corner office, they have a title, or they have their name on their door, they have people who work under them, oh, there, there's somebody we better look up to. There's somebody we better respect. There's somebody uh, we better think something about and think uh, what, that they're really somebody. But the truth is, Jesus said, the greatest among you will be your servant. In fact, when Jesus left heaven and came to earth, 
He came as a babe born in a manger. And he was reared in what would be considered a, a lower income family. Didn't have a lot of this world's goods. He took, the Bible says, he took upon him the form of a servant. And Jesus told his followers, I'm among you as one that serves. I'm not, I'm not trying to be the greatest. I'm not trying to be the, 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 the big shot. Just a servant. And our lives are forever changed because of a servant named Jesus Christ, who was the Savior of the world. Don't, don't ever underestimate the power of someone who's willing to take the position of a servant. That's a powerful position. When we read the phrase, the servant of the Lord, there's one Bible character that ought to come to mind, and his name is Moses. Did you know that I think it's 42 times Moses is referred to as a servant of the Lord. Now Moses was a great leader. Great leader of the children of Israel and several million people that he led. But 42 times when God refers to him, he refers to him as the Moses, the servant of the Lord. And what did he do? He rescued an entire nation from captivity. From being in bondage. He rescued them and led them out of the land of Egypt. He was God's leader. Could it be that God might use you or me to lead others to freedom? To lead others out of their bondage and captivity if we would just be a servant? In the sense that the Bible uses the word servant. Paul is instructing Timothy he didn't, he's not saying, Timothy, since you're, you got to work with me, since you got to be my son in the faith, since I, you know, you're, you're my heir apparent, you'll get to do this. No, 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 no. He didn't say anything like that. He said, Timothy, if you're going to rescue people, if you're going to help folks, if you're going to recover them out of the snare of Satan, you've got to be a servant. You have to be a servant of the Lord. Oftentimes, Paul begins his epistles with Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. Reminding him that that's what he is, a servant. Now, when the Bible says servant, or sometimes we use the word slave, it is not like the slaves that were in America or England, and certainly not, not like the slaves that brought about the Civil War. Sometimes people try to use the Bible as a basis that it's okay to have slaves. It's not the slavery that the Bible talks about, and I'll show you that, all right? Uh, in, 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 if a Hebrew man or woman was poor, they could agree to serve another Hebrew for a certain number of years. There were strict rules that governed that arrangement. Put something in there in Timothy. We'll come back to 2 Timothy. But let's go back and look at some of these things. And, and let's start in the book of Leviticus, okay? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Leviticus 25. Leviticus 25. We're talking about being a servant. Leviticus 25. Look with me, if you will, at verse number 39. Notice, and if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bondservant. It says, a bondservant would be what we would call a slave. It says, that isn't how you, you compel him to serve. In fact, you're, against, you're not allowed to do that. Verse 40 says what? but as a hired servant and as a sojourner he shall be with thee and shall serve thee unto the year of jubilee. And so he, he, he would, uh, there's an exception to that rule because at the end of that time of service, if he wanted to stay with the master and serve him, he could change his status. Okay, For that I want you to look in the book of Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21. 
Go back to your left and get Exodus 21. This is a different status that they could go to once they fulfilled their time of service and they were the Jubilee year came and they could be set free. Let's start with verse 1. These are the judgments where thou shalt set before them. If thou buy a Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve. And in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master has given him a wife, or she, gave, she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, he will go out by himself. Now watch this. If the servant shall plainly say, I love my master my wife and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him under the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or under the door post. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him, how long? Forever. And if a, uh, he goes on to say, if a man sell his daughter to be a maid servant, she shall not go out as other men servants do. Uh, now I want you to notice, a Hebrew couldn't be forced to become a slave. All right? But he could choose to be a slave. He could make that choice. Why would someone make a choice to be a slave? See, when, in other words, you, you would forfeit your right of citizenship. You forfeit your, basically your direction. You're going to be under the control of somebody else. Why would he choose to do that? What? Because he loved him. Because of love. Notice what he said. He said, if a servant, verse 5, shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife and my children, I will not go out free. Can you see the connection between the slave of the Old Testament and the servants of the New Testament? We willingly give up our rights, give up our freedoms to serve a master. Why would we do that? Because we love Him. And probably most important, He loves us. He loves us. And we do it for love. <clears throat> so when the Bible talks about someone who's going to rescue those who are in the snare of the devil, the concept is it has to be, the first requirement is you have to be a slave. You have to be a servant. So, so in love with Jesus Christ and what He wants for your life that you give up your rights and you completely dedicate yourself to do His will. That's not just for the pastor. That's not just for the missionary. That's for every single Christian who wants to be used by God to rescue others from the snare of Satan. Anything short of that is going to render you ineffective in helping people recover themselves out of the snare of Satan. You know, it's interesting. I mentioned Moses being called the servant of the Lord, and Moses had a servant that ministered to him. What was his name? Joshua. In fact, he took over after Moses was gone. Joshua became the next leader. You know, it's interesting. In Joshua 24, verse 29, the Bible says, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord. Huh? Isn't that interesting? He was with Moses so many years and watched Moses and followed Moses. When it came time for him to assume the leadership, you know what he just decided he'd better do? I'd just better be a servant of the Lord too. You never see Joshua saying, all right guys, I'm in charge now. You know, he didn't get Barney Fife about it. All right. No, he'd just be a servant. He just served just like Moses did. He picked up that example of being a servant of the Lord. That's the only way we'll be effective. Just being a servant. Be a servant. The servant of the Lord. Don't ever underestimate the tremendous power of someone who is a servant of Jesus Christ. Now, the second thing we have to realize. Number one, we have to realize we're servants, but then notice what he said. The servant of the Lord must not what? Strive. We must... We realize we must not argue. We must not argue. 
when it comes to rescuing those who've been ensnared by the devil, the right motive is not good enough to overcome the wrong method. The Bible says in Proverbs 25, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. A word fitly spoken. Paul is warning Timothy about striving. What is that? Arguing with somebody rather than helping somebody. It was Will Rogers who said, never miss a good opportunity to shut up. Good advice. Someone else said, of those that say nothing, few are silent. You think about that one for a minute. It's like the fellow who said, what did you say? And they said, nothing. And the guy said, I know, but how would you phrase it? You'll get that in a little bit too. Discussion. You get that, James? You just got it? Okay. Discussion is an exchange of knowledge. Argument is an exchange of ignorance. So when the Bible says not to strive, it's saying don't go to war with your words. Timothy, you're not going to reach people by arguing with them. You know what strive means? It means to go to war, to quarrel, to dispute, to fight, to argue. Look over at John chapter 6, would you please? John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Servant of the Lord must not strive. Jesus is speaking, and you, you remember John 6 is a pretty rough passage when he starts talking about the bread of life, and Jesus says, I'm that bread that came down from heaven. And, you know, they're, they're trying to comprehend what he's saying. But notice what it says in verse 52. The Jews, therefore, strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? What were they doing? They're arguing. They're arguing with each other over what Jesus had taught and over what Jesus had said. Now, remember what Jesus told us. To, look, go back to Matthew 12. Matthew chapter 12 and listen to the words of Jesus. Matthew 12, verses 18 and 19. Notice what Jesus said. Jesus withdrew Himself in verse 15 from the multitudes and, and He charged that they should not make Him known that it might be fulfilled, verse 17, by Isaiah the prophet saying, here's what Isaiah said about Jesus, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. You'll never find Jesus arguing with somebody. You'll never find him getting into a back and forth with somebody. When they tried, it never worked. They always had people trying to catch him in his words. Hmm? They would ask him, is it right to give tribute unto Caesar? He said, well, let me ask you this. And he asked them a question and they did not answer. Hmm? They asked him another question. He said, well, let me ask you this. You know, what about John? Was his baptism... They didn't know how to answer him about John. They had to walk away. He never got into arguments. He never started striving. When you don't, don't, when you're trying to help somebody who's ensnared by the devil, don't let them draw you into arguing. It's easy to have happen. Be saying, Timothy, the servant of the Lord, must not strive. When you argue about a subject, it's going to lead to broken relationships, insecurity, and it will lead to resentment. Listen, nothing glorifying to God ever happens by arguing. Whenever there's strife, pride is there. Strife and contention only comes by pride. Okay, And God's never for pride. In fact, Look at Titus chapter 3. You're in 2 Timothy 2 there. If I just have to turn one page, and I'm at Titus 3. Notice what Paul writes to Titus. But avoid, verse 9, Titus 3, 9, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies 
and contentions and strivings about the law, why do you avoid them? Because they are unprofitable and vain. What's vain? Empty. Not getting anywhere. Useless. Okay? Don't get caught up in those things. What will striving lead to? Striving leads to several things. Did you know striving can lead to violence? Often it does. In fact, I'll read a verse for you back here in the book of uh, Exodus chapter 21. Exodus 21 and verse 18. Listen carefully. It says, if, a man, if men strive together and one smite another with a stone or with his fist and he die not but keepeth his bed, if he rise again and walk abroad on his staff, then shall he that smote him be quit only shall pay for the loss of his time and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. Verse 22, If men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her and yet no mischief follow, he shall be sorely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him and he shall pay as the judges determine. In both these cases, what happened? A guys, guys are striving. What is that? Arguing. And what happened is they argued and it escalated. They got physically violent. And they hit somebody. There are, there are people incarcerated tonight all across America because they let arguing escalate and it led to violence. And it may not have been a fist. It may, not, it may have been a knife. It may be a gun. And in anger, in fact, 50% of murders are family-related arguments. War of words that led to physical violence. What else does striving lead to? Vulgarity. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 24, the Bible says this. Verse number 10. And the son of an Israelitish woman whose father was an Egyptian went out among the children of Israel. And this son of the Israelitish woman and a man of Israel strove together in the camp. And the Israelitish woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. They brought him unto Moses. His mother's name was Shalomith and the daughter of Debri of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in a ward that the mind of the Lord might be showed unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Bring forth him that hath cursed without the camp, and let all that heard him lay their hands upon his head, and let all the congregation stone him. Why did he, why did he curse and blaspheme the name of the Lord? Because he's arguing. You ever gotten in a heated argument and said something that you shouldn't have said? Or somebody said something to you or you said something out of your mouth and the other person said, I can't believe you said that. I can't believe you went there. We use those expressions. You know why we said that? We were striving. The servant of the Lord must not strive. Must not strive. Striving will cause us to use the wrong language about God and about others. In the context of helping those who are in the snare, recovering those vessels so they can be made vessels of honor, God is reminding us verbally attacking the person you're trying to help isn't going to bring a good result. When I'm arguing with someone... When you get in an argument, why are you arguing? Because I think I'm right, and that person thinks they're right, and we're going to have it out till they see it my way. And it's pride. So, listen, when I'm trying to recover someone from the snare of Satan, and I want to argue with them to prove my point, you know what it's showing? That I don't have enough trust in God to work in their heart and to bring about the change that needs to take place. i got to take it into my own hands. i got to do this. Let's trust God to move that person in the right direction. 
arguing and strife is the flesh at work. And boy, it'll bring out the old nature real quick. I read uh, a story about a preacher who was taking a walk in his neighborhood. As he walked down the street, he saw one of the neighborhood boys washing a lawnmower. He stopped to ask him what he's doing, and the boy said, I'm, uh, Pastor, I'm washing this lawnmower so I can sell it. Now, the preacher so happened to need a lawnmower. And he said, well, how much do you want for it? And the boy said, I don't know. I just want to get enough to buy a bicycle. And then the preacher said, well, you know what? I have a bicycle. How about you trade me the lawnmower for the bicycle? And the fellow said, I think that's a great idea. Let me go look at it. So he looked at it and said, boy, it's a real nice bike. We have a deal. And he shook the preacher's hand and got on the bike and rode away. Wasn't about an hour later, the preacher decided, I'll try that lawnmower out and cut the grass. He went out and got the lawnmower and checked the gas, checked the oil, primed it, pulled the cord. Nothing happened. He pulled again and again and again. It wouldn't start. And as God would have it, the little boy came riding past on his bicycle. Preacher called out to him, Kid, this lawnmower won't work. It won't start. Boy said, Oh, oh, it works. But I forgot to tell you, you have to curse at it before it starts. And the preacher said, listen to me, I'm a man of God. I don't even remember how to curse. You know what the guy said? The little boy said, you just keep pulling that cord, it'll come back to you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you're striving, there's no telling what will eventually come out of your mouth. Things that you never thought were still there, but they're there. Because once you go to the flesh, it'll, it'll, it'll take over. Dealing with broken or dishonorable vessels is not an easy thing. Especially when they don't see the danger of their situation. They think they're fine. But you know they're in a snare. You know they're headed for trouble. Because Satan is a master deceiver they don't see it they're blinded and so it gets it can it can easily create frustration when when they don't listen to what you say and if you're not careful it can go to anger you get angry at them because they're refusing your help well, I told them what to do they're not listening to me be careful the servant of the Lord must not strive. Well, Pastor, how can I not get upset? Man, I, they just make me so frustrated, so angry. How can I not do that? You need number three. You have to employ the fruit of the Spirit, gentleness. <coughs> the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men. <coughs> we know that from our RU program, gentleness is softness in manners. But you know, biblically, it has to, has to do with being able to control your hands. Not using your hands to fight other people. Not getting physical. I was reading about a shoplifter who was spotted by video surveillance in a Best Buy. This was in Augusta, Georgia. He attempted to steal a laptop computer. He was leaving the store with a computer concealed inside his coat when he was confronted by security personnel, but rather than surrender, he pulled out a knife and threatened the guards before running out of the store. Sadly for him, the United States Marines were outside the store collecting a Toys for Tots for needy children. They recognized what was going on and they stepped in to stop the thief. According to the news report, one Marine suffered a minor stab wound to his shoulder. The shoplifter was transported to the hospital with two broken arms, a broken leg, severe broken ribs, a broken jaw, a broken nose, and multiple lacerations. 
And according to the police report, he suffered those injuries in a fall attempting to escape. <laughs> that is not gentleness, <laughs> okay? <laughs> That's not the fruit of gentleness. Notice Titus, if you're in 2 Timothy, still just flip over to Titus 3. Did you notice verse number 2 with me? He says, Titus, I want you to speak evil of no man, to be no brawler, but what? Gentle. I don't want you to be a brawler. I want you to be a person who's gentle. Paul told the church at Thessalonica, when I came unto you, I was, I was like a nurse with a, with a little baby, an infant baby. He said, I was gentle among you. Even as a nurse that, that nurses her child. He says, Paul said, listen, I didn't come to Thessalonica to beat Christ into you. Okay? I came to, to, to help you. Don't, I'm not going to use, by the way, I'm not going to use my voice. That's the striving. I'm not going to use my voice to tear into you, but I'm not going to use my hands to tear you apart either. Now, let me remind you about Paul. You think Paul was always gentle? Now, before he got saved, remember what he did? He would hail men and women and get them arrested and haul them before the judges to be thrown into prison. He was a rough dude. When he got saved, the disciples didn't even want to have anything to do with him. They were afraid of him. He was a tough guy. But Christ changed him. And he had the fruit of gentleness. Where did he learn that? 2 Corinthians 10, verse 1. Paul said this, Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence and base among you, being absent and bold towards you, by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, has in everything, who is our perfect pattern in ministry and in life? Jesus Christ. Don't turn there. We could, but for sake of time, we won't. Got to get going here. You remember when Absalom rebelled against David? And they were going out after Absalom. The, the, the fight was in a very thick, thick wooded area. In fact, the Bible says that it was the, the woods that took as many lives as the, the soldiers did. And eventually, as Absalom's riding through, his hair gets caught in the limbs and he's strung up. The, 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 the horse, the mule, whatever he was on, rode out from underneath him and he's there hanging, helpless. Remember what David, though, charged his soldiers and especially Joab, the head of the army? He said, I want you to deal gently with the young man. Soft, be soft in manners. Don't, don't raise your hand against him. You know what Joab did when he saw him hanging the tree, remember? Joab took three darts and put it right through his heart. He disobeyed David's command. Didn't do what David wanted to do. He did the opposite of what David, to do, David wanted him to do. You see, gentleness isn't just soft words. It's how we physically deal with people. Hey, mom and dad, it's good for you to remember with your children. Okay? Don't, don't jerk your children around. Okay? Be careful. Be gentle. Have the fruit of the Spirit when you deal with your children. Okay? Don't, uh, when, you're, when your children are getting in the snare, it's good to remember this passage. Don't strive. Don't get into arguments. Don't... That be gentle. Okay? Hands are not for hurting the people we love. So in the Old Testament, whenever there, the Bible speaks of, of, of punishment or spanking of a child, it doesn't say your hand, it says the rod. You use an instrument of correction. Maybe a paddle, maybe a wooden spoon, maybe a board with nails in it. But um, <laughs> I'm kidding. Don't, don't do that. But... Uh, you understand it's not your hand. Your hand is for not for hurting the people we love. So we're warned about wrong words, striving, and we're warned about wrong actions. That's gentleness. 
And ask yourself this question, what message am I sending with my words and my actions? What message am I sending with my words and my actions? Now, number four. I don't know if we'll get this done or not. We'll just do the best we can. We have to be ready to teach. We have to be ready to teach. You know what? We'll start there next week, okay? It's, it's 8.20-something already, right? 8.22? We better stop right there, okay? And I'll pick it up there with ready, apt to teach. Apt to teach. There's, there's a lot there, and I don't want to blow through it and um, you know, not, not get it. So we'll just start right there next Wednesday night, okay? And we'll pick it up there if you're okay with that. I'm sure Bob is okay with that with the choir so they can practice. And uh, let's stand together for prayer, shall we? And then when we pray, Brother Toronto, would you go back to your table so folks can come back and see you? And uh, thank you again for being here this evening. Sure, it's been great to have you. Now, your, your little girl must be down in the kids' club. Is that right? Okay, they recruited her down there. Very good. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. And thank you, Lord, for the help that it's been to us tonight. Lord, we all have somebody who you put into our mind that is in the snare of Satan. And Lord, I pray that each of us would understand we have a responsibility to rescue and recover them. We, we don't want to lose any soldiers. We need everybody that we can possibly have fighting in the battle. And so, Lord, help us to understand how we can effectively do that and reclaim them for you so they can become a vessel unto honor for you. Lord, dismiss us now with your care. Lord, help us to take the message this week to a lost and dying world that there's a Savior who loves them and they can have eternal life through Jesus Christ. May others see Jesus in us. Bless the flyers as they go out, Lord. The gospel goes into people's hands, into their home. May your word accomplish what it is sent out to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.